change uh, is you know, quite common and popular in our society at the moment. Slightly less common and popular is to have that discussion with by legitimate climate scientists. Um, so with this in mind, we decided to invite Professor Manning along um, to talk about these things. He uh, was the founding director of the New Zealand Climate Change Research Institute, and he was actually part of the international panel on climate change uh, during the production of the fourth assessment report. So this is someone who actually knows what they're talking about, which is always a plus. Um, he's going to discuss how we can address uncertainty uh, in the policy context um, with a particular focus on climate change. Uh, please welcome Ben Manning. How many people here have read 
something in the general distribution of the Great. Of uh, ocean chemistry, but that's what it was about. 
And what he discovered was that carbon dioxide is not nearly as soluble in the ocean as Iranians have, and others have thought. And that was only taking out something like 25 or 30 percent of the carbon dioxide that was being poured into the atmosphere at the time. It's going to take a long, long time for the rest of it to go away. So there was a landmark paper that came out, uh, and he cited Athel's done, Athel's work. And he said this interesting thing. This is a geophysical experiment that could have happened in the past and be reproduced in the future. And they were wrong because we reproduced it. There are actually a lot of other greenhouse gases. It was in the 1970s that um, a number of others were discovered, <coughs> including the thing that's important for New Zealand because of our agricultural emissions, but methane was first discovered for its chemistry in the atmosphere. <coughs> and then, oops, it's a very strong greenhouse gas. And you can, you can look back at the science literature, and we have a flood of literature about methane before we suddenly realize, that, oh, it's a green thing. We're discovering as we go fundamental things about the planet we have to survive. Then there are cooling effects, your sulfates, combustion coming out of the air. There are all sorts of things going on in this atmosphere around us. It's getting more and more complicated. And then here's another example. CFC, you know, used in Hairspray, refrigeration. Thomas Medley, uh, who worked for one of the big uh, companies and invented CFC, he showed that you know he, he actually sort of poured it into himself and survived you know, in front of an audience. He showed it's perfectly safe, no problem. Um, well, then along comes uh, Mario Molina and Cherry Roll. Cherry Roll ran a group that was looking very much at atmospheric chemistry. He went home uh, one evening and told his wife why he now suddenly realized that what they had in her hairspray and um, in their fridge was actually friends. And we needed the ozone up there in the atmosphere. His wife then uh, got all her friends to stop using the stuff. Um, that, that ozone up there uh, protects us from high energy ultraviolet radiation coming in, which causes skin cancer or melanoma cataract, damage plants and biochemistry, and it hits, uh, goes right into the surface of the ocean and damages these things. It's something that we're protected from um, by the ozone layer, and the ozone layer is going. There were detailed studies coming out then of what this meant, how much was getting out there, what's happening. And this, uh, I know the guys who ran a, um, a major review uh, saying, well, we think it's not quite as bad as the original paper said, you know, maybe it's not too bad. And then, oof, the ozone. Suddenly, this thing appears over the Antarctic. There are three groups down there measuring the ozone above the Antarctic. For three years, they don't believe there is something gone wrong with this. It can't possibly be that low. They dismiss it. A month or two later, it comes back. Oh, my group is working again. Fine. Let's go with that now. It had to happen three times before the British group finally put out a paper explaining why it could have happened. And it was real. This is the sort of surprise that we're having to deal with now in the science. I think structural changes that are we are not expecting really can happen. I could um, talk about the attribution of climate change um, in more detail, um, but I want to go on to some other issues really about how we deal with uncertainty, because I think some of this will echo uh, points that have been made earlier this morning. In the last assessment round, um, that was five years of my life, um, we said that it was unequivocal that the climate was changing and that it was very likely that the dominant cause of that was emissions of greenhouse gases. We separate those two things out of the language quite carefully because we can see the change and that really is unequivocal. When you're looking at attribution, of course, in science, we do take a different line. And that's why we only said that was very likely. That means at least 
the next version of the, these IPCC assessments for science, uh, for the physical sciences, will come out later this month. Um, the final review session is being held in Stockholm, and governments will agree to the wording and summary for policymakers, just like I had to organise. And um, they will probably come out with, again, very similar statements, maybe slightly stronger in some way. But I want to talk about what it means for the future um, a little bit, and why I think this raises some other issues about uncertainty. Here's a major review that came out by two people I know very well in the top journal. And it's shown a probability distribution here for the amount of warming that would occur if we double the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And um, generally speaking, like in the last assessment, we said that, that what would happen would probably be in the range of two to four and a half degrees, and that's a gray shaded area. And you can see now these people coming out with lots of different distributions depending where the evidence is coming from. We're looking at things in lots of different ways, we're trying to combine all this in terms of synthesis, and that's where they end up with here. There are two different formulas of really for combining the information. We're looking at the options all the time. You know, we're not just assuming one thing must be right. You're trying to merge all the information objectively. And it's um, it's non-trivial and the the assessment will is being completed right now. It's probably going to come out with something similar but it will tweak this a bit more and it will be a little bit different again. Um, I want to uh, just point out that Arrhenius' number, way back, he came up with three numbers, three different papers in these years, and he came up with a range like that. In other words, there was an anticipation by someone who didn't have a computer. But the basic science has been there for well over a hundred years. And yet we still find people who totally reject it. If you look at the um, past and possible future temperatures, um, here's a little diagram showing the um, change for the last 1,300 years. This part is uh, here, the instrumental records predominantly. This is either what we call proxies, they're determined from uh, records in tree rings or records in uh, deposits in, in lakes and in the ocean and things like that, uh, in shells and in coral and all sorts of things. And a lot of it is combinations of different amounts of information looking for consistent patterns. And there have been a lot of attacks on one or two of these, um, but the fact that you've got so many of them these days coming up with very similar information and telling us something. This is the medieval warm period back in here. Um, here we've got um, you know, going into a cooler period. And these small changes really made a difference. You know, I mean, you could live in, you could, you could grow things in Greenland back here. You couldn't grow here. Small differences. Now we've already done this, and when you look at projections into the future, we're here. Um, it, within the next century, and this puts sort of the, the, the time scale context. Um, what, the bottom end of this range is about where we were, uh, well, we weren't, <laughs> where the planet was about 120,000 years ago. And then it was because of shift in the orbit around the sun. We've got less difference between summer and winter. And it had a structural change, meant there was much less ice in the northern hemisphere, and sea level was six meters higher than it is now. That will be around about here. What could happen this century? is we go up there, and now you've got to go back nearly five million years before you find anything equivalent on the planet. Um, I want to talk about to what extent are these numbers well defined. But here's an idea. What if there were actually two planets circulating around the sun? You know, there was another one on the other side of the sun from us. And we sort of um, found out about them and maybe with space travel with people go and visit them these days or something like that. And um, so we started, you know, well, being human beings, perhaps on both sides. We'd compete with each other, wouldn't we? And we'd, um, we'd want to do better for them. I mean, we'd, we'd say that you know, what the year was, 2013, and, you know, here's the date, and we're six months ahead of them. And they said, no, no, no. 
where's the ones ahead of you? <laughs> that's, the, that's the way people think, that's the way people operate. We're competitive, you know, it's very inherent in what we do. Um, but the point I want to make is even if, because we started to share technology or something like that, we did exactly the same thing, the planet was not worn by exactly the same amount. And this is the randomness, the, the fundamental uncertainty in complex systems that's been known, again, for about 50 years. And so, sometimes when you keep trying to say what's the best estimate for something, it's deceptive in science, really. So I want to broaden this out a little bit. Um, the whole basis for science uh, is, as you've already heard this morning, really, about testing things by experiment. And the very first paper I've already cited by Roger Abel and Hans Seuss talked about that large-scale geophysical experiment. We want to do it. We want to test. And here we have the definition of scientific method. Testing and modification of hypotheses. Criticism is the backbone. Is that going to work for everything? There's another view emerging, actually. I got to know um, Sean Hoover some years ago, and he put out a book um, pointing out that hypotheses about global change are less false by the more they are relevant to humanity. Do we have to test everything the hard way? when it might involve major catastrophe or something like that. So, how does science deal with something like that? Well, it's a journal called Climatic Change. Is this another version of the journal we're reading? I happen to know Steve Schneider very well, who started this journal, and uh, unfortunately died a couple of years ago. But then ten days before he did. Um, but this is the issue, really. You know, how do you how do you apply science when you want to avoid the experiment? Is that really what we're dealing with now? Well, you know, some people say what well, we're totally wrong, but what if we're not? So, what science? It's undergone a lot of evolution over time. You can trace back what we do in science right now to Socrates. He really set the standard for identifying knowledge in a clear way. And Plato uh, was his student, and I'm me, Plato's student. Then there was another big transition, I think, when Galileo um, was um, insisting on using precise measurement of the best telescopes that he could get of the movement of the planets to really be sure that the Earth was going around the Sun and not the other way around. Yes, he got excommunicated from the Catholic Church 30 years after he put out the initial paper and um, is that going to happen in time and time to now? They're going to be excommunicated somehow because they, they tried to do everything very carefully. But when you're looking at the the philosophy of science, Karl Popper, um, in the middle of the last century, really started to advance that quite a lot. He went into the, the method, if you like, and most of what he was doing was in response to the discovery by people like Einstein. How can you actually put all that stuff into a framework and talk about the very basis for our knowledge and to what extent we can test it? He had a student, Emery Lakatos, um, who um, put, I think they did a much better job of Popper's original um, ideas of what the basis of science was. He's not cited nearly as much, but I've given several lectures on uh, uncertainty in science, and I can make a strong argument for why Lakatos was definitely ahead of his progenitor, if you like, Carl uh, Popper. Rudolf Pyle um, put out um, a lot of stuff on, on the basis science as well, and when I did my postdoc here in Oxford, I was working with Sir Rudolph, so I got to know him very well. I never met Kuhn, but if you want to know about all this stuff, I think there's a very good review of the philosophy of science done by John Percy a few years ago, and it really shows that, you know, science has been evolving in 
in just in the last 50 years, the whole basis for which we use the, the, our knowledge, if you like, um, is really going on. But, has it gone viral? Do we have to test things by experiment? And here's another example. Going way back to the Greek time, I was a you know, who, if you, you probably know the story, but you know how um, Dylos was the father of the son and they had to escape and the father invented wind and they both grew up but Icarus won to fly to the son of the foot before it wind melted the to death. And do we learn the hard way or do we like the father and just accept sometimes? No, we'll just not take the risk. And that gets me on this whole issue of risk versus uncertainty. Um, the next few slides are um, just coming up with something about the practical perspective, but um, just to sort of bring us into a context, um, how many people here have an insurance policy? Hands up. <laughs> now you can put it down if it's compulsory because you have a mortgage. <coughs> if it's not compulsory, leave your hands up. Yeah, you see? We deal with risks. I mean, I've got a new house, it's insured against an earthquake, and I hope it never happens. There's an uncertainty, but we have a way of dealing with it. When you really think about risks, I think, it really comes up with a practical approach to uncertainty. And one of the things that um, I've been doing recently is talk to people in local governments a lot, because a lot of people in local governments will feel know they have to deal with change in blood risks and things like that. <coughs> And we talk about that you have a planning process in place to deal with a whole range of circumstances. And when you look at what's happening, you find that for that range, you can see that potential damages when things have to go away from being normal. And depending on their vulnerability, um, you know, things can be very resilient, or they can be very vulnerable, and the damages can start to escalate enormously once you go well outside the range you're used to. But there's a simple idea about risk, which is when you try to quantify it a simple way, it's just you multiply the profit of the damage. And then you get this green curve. And now, even though you get this proliferation of damages for extremes, the risks don't because the probability is dying away so fast. And this is the very structural thing in the whole basis for planning that we have, whether we're dealing with floods whether bridges will stand up to the trucks going over or whatever. <coughs> but, here's a paper that came out recently and it's showing change in the distribution of temperatures globally um, over large areas, average over large areas, put out by Tim Hansen group, uh, came out uh, last year. But he had a preliminary version of it on his web page for a little while. And this is showing by decade the distribution in temperatures. The, the pattern starts off very much like what I showed, but it changed significantly. In New Zealand, um, we're not seeing changes in temperatures so much, but there are now significant questions about flooding. And when we had the floods in Hawke's Bay in 2011, the interesting point was that they were reputed to have been as large as Cyclone Bola, and this time it didn't even get a name. But the, the, the weather forecast is not good. Still doesn't matter. Something happening. Shifting probability, going back to my curve there, where it was the, where the dash line, if it's now the, the blue curve, and the probability shifted, and the damages stay the same, look at the risk. They suddenly get moved. Local government people relate to this immediately, and they, they use my slide. Because they recognize this is happening and they have to deal with it. But now, when you're looking into the future about that, um, it becomes a bit more complicated again. Here, when we're looking at sea level rise, we can see where we're This is a paper that just came out recently that's comparing track records, three, uh, four different records of uh, past sea level rise, and what the climate model is doing, which is the gray. And what's been happening for over a hundred years?
here so that the extreme end of what we can explain. So how do we say something about the future? Here I'm putting together a summary of estimates for the amount of sea level rise that will occur by 2100. And I'm going right back to estimates that were done in the 1980s. And then the um, different, client, the different IPCC assessment reports that came out. I wasn't involved in the first, but I was increasingly involved in the second, third, and the fourth. And the fourth one, where I helped write some of the policy measures, we deliberately put a question mark on the top because we could identify at that stage that what was happening with the ice sheet was already not being treated in the models that were trying to project out into the future for what would happen. We were seeing things happen that were not built into the model. And then a whole flood of new numbers have come out. And here we've got you know, another new climate model result and what will come out later this month will be probably slightly higher than this one here. <laughs> Still going to be confidential information. But it's going to be similar. I'm not going to be up here. So if there's no change in the current rate, we would be there. I think most of us think there will be. There's a difference here between what scientists will say from their calculations and what they will say in subjective views. How do we deal with that? Well, there's two different types of stuff. This is something that, this is again, another 18 months of my life was to set the structure for dealing with uncertainty in the last half of the assessment and to get all the three working groups covering everything from engineering to medicine into basic science to use similar term terminology. And in the end, I like, got agreement <coughs> that we should separate out confidence in our understanding from being able to come up with a likelihood of a result. And this is just a simple picture showing that, you know, here's someone jumping, it's actually in New Zealand, bungee jumping. They can't calculate the chances of their dying, but they're doing it, and they're happy. <laughs> <laughs> here, you can calculate the chances, and after a while you might be unhappy. You know, I mean, they're totally different forms of uncertainty. There's a much wider field of literature on this, actually, talking about epistemic uncertainty and aleatory uncertainty. And I won't go into all that, but I will say a little bit. You can go right back to the 1940s, and the guy David Hawkins, who was from Britain, but he was working on the um, US Manhattan bomb project. And there were a lot of questions about that. Is this going to trigger some chain reaction and consume all the oxygen in the atmosphere? Will we be dead as soon as the atom bomb goes off? And he was one of the people who had to deal with that basic question. You're dealing now with risk where the damage side is virtually infinite. The probability only has to be tiny and you shouldn't do it. You know, really out of these extremes. And he was he had a so short paper in philosophy of science and he's very clear about differentiating between different types of uncertainty. And there's a lot going on. This is another example of a recent paper. Uh, why ignorance can't be turned into probability. And um, this like, you know, rolling dice and you don't know what can be on someone's side of the last year's right. So the whole, if you apply this type of approach to uncertainty and sea level rise and look what the climate models are coming out with and other plausible methods, you can, you can tie this into a framework which deals with this type of thing. But it's subjective. Really is. You know, to what extent do we trust Estimates for what happened, you know, 120,000 years ago, when they're pretty rough observations, frankly, you know, I mean, something in the Red Sea, you know, and we're trying to extrapolate the global implications of the sea level rise and the And here it comes out of the models that the readers are suspecting the models might be a bit conservative, frankly. So, what do you do? You've got to have this sort of fuzzy approach to uncertainty, and there's a lot of literature. But anyway, I want to move on now to how all this is being received um, by others. And um, because really the big issue for climate scientists is not the science, it is the communication. And I want to differentiate between skepticism, congratulations on being skeptics, and contrarianism, which we've already heard about today, which is different. And there's a lot of stuff that you can say about this. Had the email fiasco here, and they had some of my emails. 
Um, and what we find is that the way things are covered in the media is a bit different from the way it's covered in the science journal. But I want to differentiate between you know, the skeptic looking at something like this temperature record of global temperatures and someone saying, oh, look, you know, it's gone. we've been cooling since that year. No, 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 we've been cooling since that year. No, 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 we've been cooling since that year. You know? <laughs> but you're repeatedly saying, no, actually, I think the warming stopped. <laughs> Versus scientists saying, well, I'm, I'm looking at long term trends. Long term trends. So that could be an anomalously low solar cycle right in this period. And we know the sun is where we get a lot of the energy from water energy from. It's at the extent that we track it for the greenhouse effect. So you can't just say this war is due to uh, greenhouse gases or other factors. And there's natural variables. Crystal Mountain. <laughs> I could talk about a lot of the contrarian, if you like, but I was invited to give a talk at uh, a meeting in Columbia. And um, then I learned Crystal Mountain was going to be there. I knew we would turn it down and refuse, refuse to, uh, to go. Um, but in the end, I, I was invited to go and I did. Um, he had the dream chapter. But he talks about climate science. And he, he will be citing papers written by guys like Atal Rafter that I worked with, that got me into this field, and totally misquoting them. You know, and here I am as a scientist, I know this stuff backwards. I have the 30 year report. What do I do with something like this? It's really, really difficult. And at this uh, meeting in Columbia, the organizers uh, sort of took us out and showed us around the, the coffee places because they reckon they invented coffee in Columbia. <laughs> I like Columbia coffee. <laughs> and um, Monk kind of told me more than once that he's going to report me to the police. He yeah, takes a very extreme view on it. And argument, discussion, debate. But here's another dimension to this type of contrarianism. Um, I got to know Bob Watson very well when he was running the IPCC. He ran it in its third term when we produced more reports than ever before. He was pouring stuff out. There was going to be an election then for the chair of the IPCC for the next assessment round, the fourth one, I'll know that more directly involved in myself. And here is ExxonMobil writing to George Bush telling him not to vote for on record, but they're not. You know, he had to be removed from office. The, 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 the fossil fuel industry was moving in blatantly and telling the President of the United States what to do. It's on record. But there's another dimension to this type of um, contest that you have. Because in the second assessment report, the final approval process went on in Madrid. And there we ran into a Mohammed al -Saban. He, We'd never seen anyone like this in an IPCC meeting before. He was one of the skilled negotiators from Saudi Arabia who was managing the oil price global. He wasn't just the, the Saudi Arabian economy, he was the global economy, frankly. He came in and he devastated that meeting. Single-handedly, he devastated it. And we had, in, towards the end, um, the, the uh, Bert Berlin was helping, who was uh, running the whole IPCC, uh, helped Sir John Horton to try and push things through. We got about 15% about of the draft summary for policymakers approved in this session, thanks to Muhammad. And at the end, we had to try and finalize one of the last things, and so um, I was asked to go to the back of the room with Steve Schneider, who I already mentioned. And we had to cut down the final section of some of the drastically. But we could finally get it out. And we ended up with this, and we said, surprises may happen. I would attribute this entirely to Steve, but I, I helped him a little bit. And the thing was, um, what we really want to say is, as I've already pointed out, the things like the Antarctica 
you've got to expect surprises. The planet's in unprecedented state already. The word we even accepted by Mohammed al Sabah. <laughs> but the key point here is that they're going to deal with climate change. It's almost irrelevant. Come to things like intergenerational equity. And here is um, a cartoon that I love, as you know. Um, and uh, Carl has discussed uh, this discussion of greenhouse effects and why uh, he suddenly discovered something. Uh, it raises the issue, really, of do we have a political process to deal with intergenerational equity at all? Are we thinking about our children and our grandchildren when we make decisions? When the Prime Minister makes decisions? Anyway, I just want to make a conclusion about all this. Um, the challenge of science is to try and identify what can happen. And now we've got an issue where we don't want the experiment based that we're trying to And that does make the science rather different. I think the philosophy of science is evolving. I think we can come up with objective ways of dealing with that, but it's still a challenge. The challenge of society is to accept that um, we do need to limit life, you know, the guy who had wax wings and wanted to fly to the sun. No, we've got to start protecting from that. And skepticism has to be a carefully balanced approach to that epistemic uncertainty. And it has to keep quite separate from the contrary. Thank you. Okay, do we have any questions? Um, start, start with you there and then I'll go. Yes, I mentioned the book last night and I have found it. What do you think of Merchants of Doubt? How a handful of scientists obscured the truth on issues from tobacco smoke to global warming by Naomi, Naomi Orestes and Eric M. Connor. Uh, yes, I got a copy of the book, and I uh, met Naomi Oreski, who we've been with each other a few times. Um, yeah, I mean, her argument is that there really seems to have been this organised approach, organised resistance to dealing with some fundamental problems. And uh, she's pointing a lot of that comes from sections of the private sector. I think you've got to be very careful with, with these sorts of arguments. Because um, while we talk about Crystal Mountain, who pretends to be a member of the House of Lords, and he's not, I know a member, I mean, I know one of them quite well of the House of Lords, um, who uh, is, used to be part of Shell and used to run Shell International. And he's firmly believed in that. So you've got to be a bit careful about these sort of generality, I think, as well. So I mean, I agree with most of what's in that. How do you answer the John Key New Zealand Treasury argument that New Zealand is responsible for a very small amount of emissions? I think it's half a percent or two percent. Therefore, it doesn't matter what we do. Yeah. Remember when I talked about fermions and bosons and how fermion has to be in its own orbit? It's totally individualistic. And bosons are the collective. They all want to be together. I come right back to that basic aspect of thinking about how systems work. And the point is that if you look at New Zealand's emissions on a per capita basis, you know, we are right up there. You just say we're a small group of people? Well, you know, but I mean, hey, you could take China now emitting more than anyone else as a country. But you could come down to them and say, that, well, yeah, but look on a per person basis, we're way down. <laughs> or, so they ignore the problem? No, they shouldn't, you know. I mean, you, you've got to get a balance right. And I think the main thing is, if you're going to have a collective approach to a global problem, you don't try to isolate yourself, and you don't come up with these rather peculiar arguments that ignore what we're doing on a per capita basis. Not the full story, because a lot of New Zealand emissions are associated with agriculture, which is exported. And if you look at greenhouse gas emissions per person on a consumption basis, 
because a lot of then the people eat that food, they're responsible for the emission from, from methane in dairy products in New Zealand. Um, whereas a lot of the, the government process is looking at it on the producer side rather than consumer side. So again, don't separate people. Recognize that it's a collective problem. Share the responsibility. Our first speaker this morning talked about models, and she said that there must be a predictive value of value that is testable with models. Now, the IPCC case is built very much on models, and you showed some very scary modeling predictions of temperature rise in the future. How can we have any faith in these models when they have consistently failed to predict um, the rate of temperature increase, the rate of sea level rise? the rate of glacier retreat, and more importantly, they have totally failed to predict the fact that temperature has stabilized for the last 15 to 17 years. The head of the IPCC, Maturi, has said they finally admitted this in Australia last year. Your graphs are quite deceptive, I'm afraid to say, because they don't show the period um, of the middle excuse me. ice age. Um, let's not get into a, a dialogue here. You've asked the question, which is, um, how do you reconcile um, the, the existing data with the models, um, perhaps Professor Manning could answer that question. Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer the question. Um, I, I think, again, there is a level of uncertainty in the science, and we admit that. The point is, we are not talking about short-term variability. And as I've already mentioned, we've had a very unusual solar cycle. If you're looking at what happened just in the last 10, 15 years, Yes, it's not part of a smooth trend, but do we expect it to be? No, we don't. That's not what scientists expect. When we did the last assessment round, um, we had to put out these statements about what the temperature trend had been over different periods of time. Um, and the, the people who are the meteorologists said we're not going to go below 30 years. The people who are doing the climate model are saying we'd like to do 25. Some of them were saying 20. We compromise, okay, we, we gave a trend for the last 25 years. But even then, some of us were saying that that's going to fold in things like change in the frequency of El Nino events. And that's changed. Just in, that, in the period you're talking about, we have seen a shift in the patterns of El Nino. And so, what's that doing? Does it have long term implications? I think when you look at the basic energy balance, what we're finding is not more than 90% of the heat that's trapped near the surface by the greenhouse effect is going into the ocean. That's heavily documented by hard data now, more than 50 years of data. And the oceans have this cycle. They're doing things differently. They just have to sort of shift that distribution of heat from near the surface down, down below, and suddenly you'll see temperature changes. This can be linked to the El Nino and things like that. And so when you look at the total energy balance, Yes, we'd still like to know more, but we don't, I would say as scientists, we don't see anything that refutes the validity of the models, which are long-term projections. They're looking long-term averages. They're not dealing with interannual variability or even decadal variability. That is something that's still a challenge. Okay, we'll just have one last question up here. Uh, in, in the 90s, I used to summarise uh, climate science issues for the coal industry, and I found that the IPCC coordinated excellent summaries of their peer reviewed science. But even at that early stage, there was strong critical criticism of a small group, among the science working group, um, who were pre um, preparing selective wording for the summary for policymakers for the country approval. You can't kind of refer to a bit of that. Um, do you agree uh, with some of that criticism was justified? And how do you think the IPCC has evolved uh, to cope with the lack of evidence of strong warming, as Alistair said, and listening to the range of sceptical criticism? Well, it, I mean, it's hard for me to take anything other than a subjective response to that, you know, because I was so closely involved. I have to be careful. Um, but let me give an example. When, in the last assessment report, one of the issues that came up was a number of people uh, put in comments on one of the chapters saying, we don't think you've covered all the things that could be happening with solar radiation. And the lead authors of that chapter 
um, modified their text to reflect that, and they admitted that there could be something happening with ultraviolet that we haven't identified. Now, but in science, if good scientists always recognize uncertainty. And if someone can point to an objective <coughs> argument why, you know, there is another le level of uncertainty, then yes, the IPCC should be included. If we want to look at some of the IPCC report, I can probably criticize them in far more detail than you can because I know far more about them. But the Wing Group 2 report last time had a fundamental error about what would happen to ice in the Himalayas. It was totally wrong. You know, and why it ever got in there, I have no idea, particularly the Japanese government picked it up in the, in the last round of review comments from the authors that have made the change. IPCC is not perfect. But we didn't make those sorts of mistakes in Wing Group 1. God. And um, I think that overall, the information coming out of the process is more reliable than less reliable. So I wouldn't just ignore it. Okay, thank you very much, Mum.